Oh, welcome along, team. This is episode two of Rugby Unwrapped. We're calling this episode, uh, Where Are We Going? We've had Where Are We At? And it was great chat with Rob Nickel from the New Zealand Rugby Players Association, Chris Lendron from New Zealand Rugby, Simon Porter and TJ Perenata. Simon Porter from Halo Sport joins us again, as does Melody Robinson, a former Black Fern and World Rugby commentator and now working in the upper echelons of Television New Zealand. And a very special welcome all the way from Melbourne, a new member of the New Zealand Rugby Board, Bart Campbell, also New Zealand Rugby's nominee and representative on World Rugby's Executive Council. G'day, everyone. Kia ora. Kia ora, Scotty. Afternoon. Guys, um, the purpose of this chat is, I guess, having had discussions in our first episode about you know where the game is at here in New Zealand, I thought it was good if we could maybe progress the vision for the future. And, and Bart, it's especially great to have your input on this, uh, given uh, the new position you hold. But by way of an introduction, what, what is your background, Bart, uh, with sport in particular uh, and, and with rugby? Uh, well, I've been faffing around the edges of rugby for a long time, really. Um, first, I worked with uh, young Simon Porter, um, where I, I was a very poor agent representing players. Um, figured out that I wasn't very good at that and sort of tried to build a business that became broader and, and more diversified working in rugby, including looking after the commercial rights of things like the Lions Tour to South Africa in 2009, Celtic League as it was then, uh, Heineken Cup, and then helping out World Rugby with some commercial stuff around sevens. So I guess I've been involved in the business of sport for over 20 years now and particularly um, and really focused on rugby over that time. Uh, and not to forget that I have dabbled in, on the dark side in the NRL as well. You, you have a great connection with the Melbourne Storm, in fact, and I know a lot of New Zealanders uh, really like and, and respect that club. Having had that involvement, Bart, has is that, is that given you a whole lot of different ideas about how rugby can operate and, and lessons learned through the NRL? Yeah, I think so. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the opportunities that the NRL has is the ability to move quickly particularly as it goes to things like changing of rules. And that is something that rugby struggles with. Clearly, it's much more committee-based. It's a global proposition. And therefore, you find things uh, from different hemispheres have different appeals and things get bogged down. So I do like the way the NRL can move um, from a speed of sport point of view. But I guess one of the appeals to me about being at the Melbourne Storm is it really gave me an overview of what it's like being in club land in a rugby context, what it's like being in a province or a super team, really. So... I think that understanding is important given the the new role that I've got at the moment. Well, guys, well, let's start really then uh, because you've you've brought up the the dreaded G word, Bart Global, um, and New Zealand Rugby does sit within a global alliance. It is called World Rugby. That is the sanctioning body of our sport, uh, and that's where you'll be spending a, an awful amount of time, I'm sure, in the coming months. But just how strong. Uh, guys, and, and anyone can feel free to jump in here. Do you think that New Zealand rugby is in the world system? How strong are the alliances that New Zealand rugby currently has, both regionally and globally, for that matter? Simon, you go first, and then I'll go. And then Bart's last. <laughs> well, I think I think from a... If, if you look at it from a playing point of view, then clearly All Blacks is a really significant brand, um, you know, potentially can be used to lead the way into growth areas, into the Americas and the Asian market. You know, the All Blacks are incredibly well known. So from a performance point of view, New Zealand rugby is very strong. We're very respected when it comes to rules and how the game's played. We're seen as being innovative, all that side of things. So I think if we're talking about what happens out on the pitch and and particularly our coaches uh, who are scattered all around the globe in really influential positions, then... Yeah, we have a very strong say. It's it's off the pitch um, where, you know, I think without doubt the, the power base still sits up in the north and it is hard for New Zealand rugby with its partners with South Africa and Australia who we, we are aligned with um, but we're not com- in complete alignment at all times, I suppose. But we have to try to use those to get um, as much influence and... and um, scraps when it comes to sitting at the table as we can. Mm. So um, my perspective is often watching from, um, I guess, being in the room with World Rugby representatives, seeing Steve Chu in action, having conversations with many different people in World Rugby um, over the seven circuit uh, as well for many years. 
Um, and I think that Steve Chu's force of his personality, um, his administrative n- nous, uh meant that we had a good, strong influence um, at world rugby level, but we were reasonably weak because we only had one person with long relationships with a lot of people at world rugby level. Um, so it wasn't going to last forever. So now we're sort of starting a little from scratch. I know, Bart, you know a few people in world rugby scenes, um, but with Mark Robinson, you, um, I'm not sure if Deb Robinson's back on board with you guys, um, but, you know, there's a lot of rebuilding to do there, getting to know people um, and influencing. And the other thing I've always noticed, uh, which maybe it's because um, it isn't until recently that I've had a job where I'm on the broadcasting um, side, the commercial side of the business, but I've heard a hell of a lot of negative comments um, from people who work in world rugby, um, from fans, supporters, commentators. Um, There is an undercurrent of maybe resentment or dislike, and I think it comes down to New Zealand's success. Um, Maybe we've made some mistakes in the past with the way that our attitude has been around certain um, World Cup tournaments. 91 was a great example, um, our handling of the 2003 Rugby World Cup. So I think there's a hell of a lot of work to do um, in terms of world rugby. But I'd, I'd like to. Hear, I'd like, you've you've listened to two uh, opinions at least. So you know, where do, where do you see it from your perspective? Well, Melly just made me very nervous. Um, <laughs> so look, <clears throat> yeah, there are challenges, no doubt. And I think Simon started on the right vein. Look at a Sanzar level. Um, you know, COVID is really going to put that alliance under pressure in the near term because. None of us know what the world looks like in March of next year. And I think the challenge that everyone's grappling with is how, how does every country serve up a competition next year that will not be interrupted? I think you can survive a, a major catastrophe once from a business point of view and from a fan engagement point of view, but twice is really hard to overcome. So I think everyone is running around now looking at how do they give some certainty as to what 2020 looks like acknowledging that um, over time, hopefully, some form of normal service can resume. And then at the World Rugby table, the beauty of um, naivety is that you just, I don't i don't understand the historical angst and I don't understand the reasons for the historical sort of um, hostility. Hostility is too strong. But, yeah, there are petty jealousies or feuds or whatever, and, and I, there actually is no need for it because... If you can grow the game together, then everyone can win. And, you know, if you can start at that level, uh, then everything else really does become irrelevant. Is Sansa more than just an alliance to put together a broadcast package? I think one of rugby's big issues is that we always concentrate on what's wrong, you know, and we, we, we criticise, we constantly criticise. And I think, so Sansa does have some issues, you know, from where I sit and what I see, it is, it's that self-interest thing. They're not completely aligned all the time. You know, we, we're, I mean, we love playing Australia and South Africa because we love bashing them. So it makes sense that it's sometimes we don't always see eye to eye and we, you know, come from different backgrounds. But it's still been an incredible success. You think about how quickly that thing had to be thrown together when rugby went professional, and it has still managed to put on however many games of Super Rugby every year, have a winner, have some losers, uh, and still grow the the game professionally in all of those areas. It has done some incredibly good things, but I think the question now comes, and we're going to get into stuff like player welfare and all that sort of stuff, from a from a fit for purpose longevity point of view, it just doesn't seem to make sense to keep asking our players to go round and round the world to play football. So um, I think there has to be change because I just don't think we're going to continue to be able to to stay completely aligned. Um, I just look at this like a normal business industry and I'll just say define it as sport entertainment. Um, So obviously they're competing against NRL, um, the netball competitions, those kind of sports events. But the truth is that this industry, the profits and the appeal to customers has gone down because the threat of substitutes with Netflix, um, all other kinds of entertainment. um, And then I guess maybe it serves some customers really well, like your sports um, fanatics and people like me who have a real passion for rugby. But if you look at the value um, that people want from entertainment products, um, and I'll use women as an example, 
Um, it's and girls. Girls are all about fun and socialization. Um, women are about um, festival events, spending time with family, kids, um, food, drink, all of that kind of thing. And I think that the product of rugby isn't providing the value for um, our segmented um, customer base now. So for me, um, something has to change around the way that product is addressed. All Blacks is fine. It's a huge event. Um, it doesn't matter about all of the other stuff around it because it's about the All Blacks, but it's Super Rugby, um, which needs to have some drastic changes um, and listen to some of the audience and people um, that it's that are buying its tickets, really, or not buying them, as the case may be. But isn't that part of the problem? You've got Senza that is running both the international competition between South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Argentina, the rugby championship. You've got Senza that is ostensibly running a Super Rugby competition, and yet when push comes to shove, no one really knows what Sanzar's role is in the formulation of these competitions other than saying, here's the draft and uh, we're going to run a few referees because there's no voice. We don't hear from a commissioner of Super Rugby, for instance, like we do with so many other major leagues around the world. So is Sanzar just an organisation in name alone or does it have some clout when it comes to running these competitions and running them independently, as I mentioned, of the self-interests of the various members? But... <laughs> look, what, what, yeah. um, look what, what I'd like to say about Sansa is undoubtedly it could be improved and, and how and what that looks like I think is being worked through at the moment. Um, I, I would argue that Sansa probably hasn't been set up to be as successful as it could be for the reasons you've alluded to. That is the, the body doesn't have a lot of control and it's hard to herd four disparate stakeholders to get coordinated outcomes that really grow a product, whether that be Super Rugby or the Rugby Championship. So, you know, there are probably some governance challenges within how that is set up. But the one thing I would say is, and it comes back to, you know, if you define success by different outcomes, I think every World Cup by one has been won by, you know, a Sanzar participant since Super Rugby was set up. So, yes, it's got its failings and they are many and varied. But ultimately, you know, as we all sit around as patriotic People in South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, we keep winning World Cups. So, you know, it, it's not all broken, and I understand that. I think one of the challenges of trying to be all things to all people from a Sanzar point of view and to coordinate all of your partners' broadcast markets is that you end up putting games on at a time which is inconvenient for your local fan base. And I think that would be one thing, um, you know, that I, I would encourage people to look at more is how do you make the game more accessible to people? And I think yeah. that is a challenge and an opportunity. Yeah, we spoke a bit about that on, on episode one, actually, and, and a lot of that is related to the fact that we've we've got generations of, of kids who, who don't stay up till 10 o'clock at night watching games of footy and, and the South African element in Super Rugby, and they would feel the same way. A three o'clock game of rugby in New Zealand in the afternoon does not suit a South African time zone. The other, the other thing about Sands uh, Ports, and, and you mean you deal with players, you deal with coaches, you deal with competitions around the world, Sansa has been set up or originally was set up to represent Australia, New Zealand and South Africa's interests. Uh, it has come to mean more than that. It's come to represent the Southern Hemisphere. Does it? Because still today we don't have engagement really with uh, the West Coast of America. We don't have engagement really financially uh, with the Pacific. Uh, Japan has been in Super Rugby. It's now dipping back out again. So how does Sansa look after all the people in its neck of the woods in a productive way because while it, you're right to say that it was set up very quickly and it's, and it's seen extraordinary success in some departments, has it really garnered the support of the entire Southern Hemisphere if we are to split the globe right around the middle? When are we moving on to solving the Middle East problem? Because I reckon it's about as complicated as that. Uh, it's, it's really, I, I think, that in... I know we want to talk about global calendars and that later, but the hardest thing with the Southern Hemisphere, when you look at it as a whole, what the Sanzar Alliance has uh, afforded New Zealand, Australia, South Africa and Argentina to a degree was the ability to retain their talent in their country. Um, and so, and with the different contracting models, but New Zealand and Australia are sort of central contracting model, we got to control the players. So from a performance point of view, everything is very aligned and it's together. The most difficult thing about trying to uh, really drive uh, better outcomes, uh, performance outcomes with, the, with Samoa, Fiji, Tonga, etc., is all of their players are up north. All of their players are away. So... 
just throwing and, and, and because that's where they can make their money. We put up barriers down here for them to be able to come and play Super Rugby because you have to be eligible to play for New Zealand to get a contract. Same in Australia, there are overseas player restrictions, all that sort of stuff. So everyone's up there. So to be able to then bring everyone back to either play in a domestic competition or to perform at a really high uh, or to perform well at international level is really, really difficult. So whilst we are seen because of geography that we want to help the Southern Hemisphere nations, the reality is their financial base is up north because they're the guys that pay their players' wages. So it's actually, it, it's a really hard problem to solve. How do you, how do you fix that? I think too, um, Sumo, um, one of the customers of, of rugby is the broadcaster, right? And you would have to say that somebody like Sky TV does get what they need from Super Rugby. They get, um, what, a good four months of um, competition. Uh, the New Zealand derbies rate very well. Um, when Australia is strong, some of those games are in really good time zones for uh, New Zealand as well. So um, that drives subscriptions because they've got a reasonably good competition over a long amount of time and then excellent test matches. So um, it's not failing in all areas. It's just uh, losing its gloss with larger segments of the audience, I think. Well, and again, it's it's the power to expand and the power to say, yes, the, the player base is playing north from a Pacific point of view. Ports, we know that, you know that. But if there were opportunities here, could that player base be situated in the south and therefore could we could continue to support growth in the Pacific Islands? I know it, it all comes down to money. At the end of the day, the finances are crucial here. But I would, end- I would argue we have to, Sumo. Yeah. We actually have to step in and do something uh, as a nation to contribute more to Pacific Island rugby. We, rugby. We've been a very large beneficiary of it over time. Um, and also, I also think what, what has been status quo in Europe won't be status quo going forward. I mean, I was chatting to a, an owner of one of the clubs in England last year. He's advocating for a 90% salary cap reduction from 2021. Uh, and another one of his colleagues who is very, very wealthy is advocating for a 50% reduction in the salary cap. Arguably, there are two clubs in the Premiership who could go under in the context of the impact of COVID. That sees 70 players released into the market. And what happens in the time of um, pain is contraction, and contraction also uh, with the geographic desire to look after your own. And if that happens in France as well, they will look after their own players first. And that does provide an opportunity for us to open our arms up and welcome back to this part of the world. Um, some Pacific Island players, and I hope we take that opportunity. Well, how does the investment work? Can we, do, we, do we not put the investment before the return? Because we know that there have been overtures made to Sanzar about franchises in the Pacific, whether that's through Hawaii, whether that's through Fiji, whether it is Samoa alongside others. And it always comes to the same answer. Chairman of New Zealand Rugby, Brent Abbey, said they just don't stack up financially. At what point? Does the investment come before the return? You still have to pour some money in to get some money out, don't we? And and, and I know we're talking regionally here, not not our own patch, but but it's a, it's crucial to the growth of our game to bring these nations inside this tent, surely. Just one comment on that. It would have been a lot easier to answer that with a favourable outcome pre-COVID-19. Uh, so it will require greater creativity, but... Um, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. So what, you know, what is going on, the work that's going on at the moment, hopefully will provide some opportunities that you allude to. Can't say much more than that other than um, let's keep watching the space and see what happens. And, and Scotty, I, I mean, I go back to last year's World Cup. That Fijian team, um, I got the pleasure of doing sideline and um, commentary for that side for four of their games. With so little prep time, they still managed to be in my mind, the most exciting product there, aside from the All Blacks, of course. Um, Their athletes are incredible. They had muscles bulging everywhere. They've got so much marketability. They've got deep stories. They they need someone to believe in them, to sell them commercially, if indeed some of those players come back. You know, there needs to be investment, but I think there needs to be a change in the sponsorship model and the way that uh, teams, Fijian, Pacific Island and women's rugby teams are sold. Um, and to think outside the box with some of these sponsorship deals that they're trying to put together. Well, okay, let's let's sort of wrap this sort of section up with what's really driving the, the global demand for sport. I know we're in the time of COVID here, but even beforehand, I mean, if we could 
sit there and say, we're not dealing with this right now. COVID is not an issue. Rugby continues as rugby's always continued. If so, what was driving the global demand for our sport? Where were the dollars coming from? Where were the fans coming from? And what was the appetite for growth and for change? Start with you, Simon. Um, well, I mean, there's no doubt that the TV dollars are pretty critical. And every time anybody talks about anything, the, the, the broadcast money that it brings in is huge. But that's not the same everywhere. Like up in France, talking to, you know, our guys up there, the biggest issue French rugby has moving forward is that they actually derive a larger percentage of their income from the matchday experience. And that's why if you're lucky enough to game in France, it is just an outstanding experience because they have to work so hard to sell out the stadiums and give good experiences, etc. So there, it's a little bit different up there, I'd say, but everywhere else it's the broadcast dollar. And so I think um, one thing that rugby hasn't really embraced is the power of the individual too much. We've always had star players, but we still have the stoic view that rugby is about the team and the team come first, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if you look at other sports, and I'm really interested in Bart's views after his, um, you know, his days with the NRL, it's the noise around sport that is so compelling, and that's where I think we really have to get to. If you think about the stories that come out of the uh, NFL or basketball or baseball or whatever, so much so much of it is about the individual. And if we look at what's happened over the last six weeks, it's the same in Australia. They're really good about talking about their games. And the NRL has led our daily news coverage for six weeks because the NRL like talking about themselves and they and they have to talk about themselves because it's competitive and it's the, the noise around the sport is actually what engages lots of people. The talk, the, you know, the ESPNs, the Sports Illustrated, the Bleach Reports, all that sort of stuff is absolutely critical. And if rugby doesn't really make that leap and accept that we have to, you know, have more noise, then we're not going to change. And we are just going to be continually focused on 30 people playing the game in the middle of the field, which it sometimes I think is a bit of a red herring when it comes to attracting sponsors and money. Our latest you're talk, research You're talking well. hype. You're talking hype, aren't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Latest, hype, noise, yeah. Our latest research from TVNZ um, over the last 12 months um, has shown us that Kiwis want the stories. They want to know about the athletes, who they are. They want to be inspired. Um, that's men and women. Um, and they don't want to just see the results um, uh, or the statistics. And these days, the consumption around results has changed. You get it off the internet. So um, creating the story and the hype is crucial for developing the brand around these sports and yeah, attention, I guess. But I know you were instrumental in, in taking the All Blacks, for instance, to America. Um, and, and that was pitched not as a test match. It was pitched as a, a rugby festival, an event. Uh, and, and being a part of, of both the All Blacks' recent trips to the US from a fan point of view and from a, a journalist point of view, uh, they were just great events. There were things happening every day during the week. There was hype around the city. You, you had sold a vision to, uh, I guess, a, a, a city and a country that had no real deep engagement with the game. Is that the future for footy? And to say, oh, it's not just about this series, it's not just about this competition, these matches have to be standalone rugby events, sporting events. Yeah, like I think that's part of it. I think scarcity helps in the US. So, you know, it's new, it's novel, it's exciting. I think having a, you know, from an event point of view, having a 3pm kickoff is really useful because you know, people get to wind up beforehand, offer a spot of lunch, roll into a game. The weather's still nice, it's sunny. It might have been cool, but it was, you know, pleasant enough. And then on to the, you know, into the evening uh, of, of a great town like Chicago afterwards. So, yeah, part of it is uh, having a city that supports you. So I think in New Zealand and in Australia particularly, cities are big stakeholders in games. So, you know, the Wallabies will run tenders as to who hosts the Bledisloe Cup and the cities get behind it. And I think one of the things, as you've alluded to, that's incumbent upon you if you take that money is to turn it into an event and to build it up. Um, <clears throat> there's, been, there's somehow by default or otherwise, there's kind of developed a, a same, same pattern under the rugby championship. You know, historically, one test in Brisbane, one test in Sydney, and you knew when the dates were. And I don't think that's a good thing. So 
I think um, scarcity and variety are an important uh, element to successful events. And I also think that from a generating of money point of view, you know, you've got to engage with fans better. Uh, and that includes, you know, which I don't think New Zealand does well yet, is a membership offering. I mean, it's a really important part of society in Australia, particularly in the AFL. I mean, Collingwood have got 80,000 members. That's effectively 80,000 season ticket holders. They don't go to every game, but every year they hand over their $50, $150 to say, I'm in. I'm part of this gang. And it's the tribalism and it's the belonging that comes out of being attached to something that's bigger than you. And I think that's an opportunity for us. Yeah, and that's the gap. You're talking about a sport in, in the AFL in particular that has been around for a very long time, professionally speaking. Rugby still uh, is only 25 years old from a professional point of view in this part of the world. But we never went out there at the start of professional rugby. I use the term we. Rugby was never pitched as something to join. We had provincial representation, so you had your community was represented by your team. You had the All Blacks, which represented your entire nation. Professional rugby came along. First of all, they were franchises. No one really got the geographical link between them, and no one could join. Uh, the nature of a club is something you can join. We can call super rugby teams clubs now, but there is still no club that I can see. Uh, and uh, a ticket holder, a, a season ticket holder, a member should be more than just a bum on a seat. They have got to be engaged by their club and given an offering. There is nowhere for a super rugby fan to go from an HQ point of view. There is no equivalent in New Zealand of a rugby leagues club still. And, and I find that extraordinary ports. And I, and I wonder if those are the kinds of things that we need to be starting to think about here and, and perhaps we should have been thinking about 20 years ago. Yeah, well, I mean, that membership thing, it is embraced up in the north in rugby. You know, that's what, like when I go and watch a Poe play, um, it feels like the, the, the feeling I get is what I get when I'm down supporting my local club, North Shore Rugby. It, you, you feel that sort of fabric of the community coming together, whereas definitely when you go and watch a Super Rugby game, I mean, they're all different, but you do sort of feel like you are watching something as opposed to being part of it. And it's, you know, I know Bart loved going and watching the Northampton Saints or whatever. It's the same in the UK. And they're really good at, at, at giving you that membership offering. They, You come in, you have your beers, you know, your pie or whatever, then you go somewhere afterwards into the into the big long room. The players come out, they mingle, they have the aftermatch. In New Zealand, we get let into a ground just before kickoff, and then we are often asked to leave if you're sitting around finishing your beer talking about the game. Well, where do you go? Why Why are we letting people walk away when they've still got, when, they, when it comes down to money, but they still want to buy a beer, talk about the game, do whatever? That, that's the bit that I just, it's the starkest difference between watching rugby in that hemisphere and watching rugby down here. Yeah, and I would put it to you, Mel, and, you know, full disclosure, Mel and I both worked for a very long time uh, for Sky TV, the broadcaster, so we understand you know, what our role was in in the game and, and promoting the game. But ultimately, we would turn up to grounds and, and we had golden tickets. We could be on the sideline. We worked in that environment that the fans couldn't engage with. But I'd put it to you that our stadium experience, with respect to those running these stadiums, the match day experience has not changed since the 90s. And in fact, it's just become even more um, difficult for families to get along to these games, not just because of the time, but also the cost. Yeah, so uh, for so mothers are the most powerful um, group that rugby should be focusing on, right, really, because we're the ones that get our kids to the rugby games. I coach Jensen at College Rifles for the last three years. And so I'm going to take my fan experience from that mum point of view. And um, it's mixed. So... Auckland Rugby uh, does quite a good job with giving free tickets to Eden Park. Um, the Blues, obviously, there's a charge there. But when I go to a Blues game, um, the only activity for kids is um, you get a Blues flag or you get your face painted. And sorry, but kids 10, 11, 12, no one wants their face painted, guys, so um, it's just not cool. And then as a parent, I don't want to give my kids a slimy pie or chips. I want more options. I asked the CEO of Eden Park... You know, where's the healthy options? Where's all the variety? Oh, well, they, they sign catering deals. Um, they can't uh, sustain, you know, different types of catering because there's so few events there, blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe the venue's wrong for um, if they really want to get kids 
uh, mums and other people are engaged. But then I have a great experience at my rugby club, which is College Rifles, um, namely because they do have wine on tap and all of the mums go in straight after trainings and after games on a Saturday afternoon because <laughs> it's cheap wine. And then the other one is <laughs> the Bar Bars Club. Um, they're brilliant. So they brought women in maybe about six or seven years ago. And my experience is there. I go up, I can have um, a home cooked meal up there. I get to chat to some of the biggest legends in rugby. I get to flirt with rugby players that I used to like. My husband's there with me. Don't worry about it. Um, and then we go and watch the game and we can go back up and we can take our kids in there if we want. So there's a whole mixture of different things happening, but no concerted um I guess, homogenous effort or even acknowledgement from the bigger organisers of Super Rugby or, or um, Auckland Rugby or Eden Park to really capture um, and engage with that, you know, mum, child um, and wider audience. But give us a, give, yeah, give us I want a comparison. to hear from on this. I, I, I just need a comparison point because we know that Australian clubs do this so well. I've, I've seen it firsthand. Yeah. The challenge in New Zealand is that the teams don't own the stadiums, right? So therefore they're just a tenant and that adds another layer of friction to your experience as a fan. And so um, Australia, uh, that's kind of been removed by the fact that typically the stadiums are owned by government authorities and they're all not for profit. And so, you know, provided uh, it's not insane, they will enable you to do whatever you need to do to give your fans good experience on the day. And that's one thing I'm proud about at the Storm is that we we really work hard to give our fans because you've got to get, convince people to get there and you've got to convince them that getting there is better than sitting on their couch. And if you live in Melbourne, and unfortunately I'm looking like I'm, I'm out sunbaking today, but unusually the sun is out. It's not a normal thing here in winter. And so you've really got to make people work come out and uh, wrap up and, and embrace an afternoon's football. Uh, and New Zealand's the same. We've got the same climate, maybe by north of Auckland. So just have to invest in that. And I think some part of it is actually keeping your stadiums honest and um, and knowing what you need to do. Um, and there's always a mixed use. And so who, who wins? And, uh, you know, from our point of view, we know that we have sort of 26 rounds a year. And that gives us enough hooks into the stadium to get the outcomes we need. Uh, with Super Rugby and a Mitre 10 Cup, you've kind of got a fractured season. So which tenant do you look after more? Uh, and so I think just decomplicating arrangements uh, could get better outcomes for everyone. And ultimately, you know, the goal is to have better stadiums that are fit for purpose. Christchurch has got one coming. and will take a while, but it will be a game changer for the fans' experience. I think Dunedin has shown what a, a new modern stadium can do. And I think even if it's not necessarily for the fans, it's certainly they put on a great show as a result of that venue. So, yeah, there are things to do, but they're all achievable over time. Marketing comes down to a few simple tenants a lot of the time. And, and one of those tenants is the feeling of belonging. It's a pitch that so many products and services make that, that we value you. Do we value our fans in this game? Have we put enough value on the people who want to watch, who support these teams, whether they be Mitre 10 Cup, Super Rugby or the All Blacks, do we value them enough? Are they more than just a number? Ports, I know you work in the game and we work, we work across professional sports, so it's different for us. But talking to your friends, and of whom you have many, do they feel valued? Do they feel that it's worthwhile going to a game of footy? Well, well... The thing that I guess disappoints me is I do have a whole lot of mates that, you know, on your WhatsApp chats or whatever, and they'll talk about league. You know, these are guys that played the game and whatever, and a lot of them have fallen out of love with the game. Um, and a lot of them cite that it's too complicated, and I think it's one thing that, you know, Bart touched on it earlier, where, you know, NRL is so nimble. Like, I love the way they can move, and if something doesn't work and the fans are telling them they don't like something, they change it, whereas... Rugby just can't work like that. So I think rugby's descended into this cycle where we keep talking about how we're going to tinker with the rules, et cetera, et cetera. All we're doing is saying the game's broken and it doesn't work. We are forever talking about how we can change the game, you know, that the actual physical action that happens by 30 men or women out on the middle of the pitch. And I just don't think that matters. I just think we've got to look at all of the other stuff and stop saying that our game's broken, that we love our game, that, you know, we, we, we play it, get used to it, these are the rules, and let's just keep 
keep um, just stick at the set of rules and try to get these people to come along for the ride because I, you know, it, it does. And when my mates give me, um, you know, hell for players are going overseas and you know you're selling national assets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I'm like, well, go to the game, mate. When was the last time you went to a game? Go and put your bum on the seat and support the team. Yeah, but exactly. But why should they? They probably feel I'm paying whatever I'm paying a month in subscription television or a streaming service, whatever that might be. They think, well, that's the investment I've made in this sport because the sport keeps telling me that the broadcast dollar is everything and we've got to get that in the door. And once we've got that broadcast deal, everything else is a bonus, which to me puts the fan right at the bottom of your list. Seriously. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I think, however, to engage with fans properly, you need to spend money. And the ecosystem of rugby is not overflowing with money. But there is this perverse paradigm. The more you spend, the more you generate. And the more engaged your fans feel. And, um, you know, I think then that is really important to sustaining the sport. So uh, I don't think fans are taken for granted. But I think that uh, people don't spend enough yet because they really just don't have the funding. I mean, going back in time, from an NRL point of view, you know, we used to get beaten over the head by the NRL commission about how dumb we were and how we didn't engage properly with our fans. Why weren't we like the AFL? They had 80,000 members. We only had 30,000. We said, well, they get funded $19 million a year and we get funded 10. So if you want to give us some more money, we will hire six more marketing people, you know, and, 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 and. And in the end, um, you know, they did increase the funding and we plowed that all back into uh, providing a service to our customers but it takes money. Do we have it? Do we have enough right now where you sit from a board point of view, Bart? Uh, because New Zealand rugby, and we spoke to Chris Lindrum about this in episode one, it, it is a complex system. You are owned ostensibly by your members. You're an incorporated society. The demands are that anything you generate gets fed back into the game, into the provincial unions. So where is the one weak point in this model? Do we turn super rugby clubs into purely privately funded organisations so that New Zealand rugby can talk about high performance, their national sides and their provincial union members? Or does that not quite work because the super rugby clubs are so important in the pathway to the high performance program? I've been to one ball meeting where I had to <laughs> nominate Brent Impey and support him as being re-elected as chairman. It lasted <laughs> half an hour. You know, we're asking way too much out of me. I'm just going to... Kick the touch here. <laughs> no, it's fair enough too, mate. Look, I, I know that, you know, you, you once you get your feet under the table, the, the reality of the situation will become clear. And New Zealand rugby and their defence have been very transparent uh, in talking about the financial uh, stresses they are under and the hardships they face. But, I mean, Mel, you, you played provincial rugby. You played national representative rugby. You're a World Cup winner with the Black Ferns. One of the things that we are struggling with right now is – investment in the game. We have seen investment begin to grow in the women's game in particular, and we've seen growth in the women's game in particular. That is going to come under some threat now because the money cannot stretch to everything. Is there a feeling in the women's game that they are united, that they want to make sure that they continue to be funded and continue to grow? A hundred percent. I try not to be too political and stick my head out too often, but on this one, I'm really worried. Um, you know, with the job losses at NZRU, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's um, the women's uh, offices uh, would have been shorn at PU level and also the New Zealand rugby uh, funded one. Um, and there's a justification for that. But all of that good work that's been done over the last two to three years uh, to bring women's rugby to a great level at Farrah Far Palmer Cup the Black Fern success, uh, obviously New Zealand women's sevens team who are part funded by high performance sport. Um, so they are a little bit separate from the other pressures for the Black Ferns and Farah Palmer Cup and women's club rugby. Uh, and just uh, finding new talent, um, supporting the competition structures, putting Farah Palmer Cup on television. If that reverses, all of that good work has just gone down the toilet and it really breaks my heart to think um, it's a possibility. And if the New Zealand Rugby Union really are um, about inclusiveness, um, diversity, respectability, I've probably got that combo wrong, not sure, um, then 
surely there's an argument here that um, A, it's a basic human right for young girls who play rugby to have the same opportunities as young boys. Um, that the investment um, needs to be put in, um, well, A, it's not about equality, it's more about equity, but because the investment never was put in for years and years and years for so many reasons, and the main one was that rugby was a sport for men. And so there's a lot of catch-up to be done here. But my, mainly the argument is the only growth area in New Zealand rugby in terms of participation is in women's rugby, girls and women's rugby. And why the hell would you turn off the tap to the only area that you're growing numbers in? Um, and also, don't forget, girls, women, they become the most powerful consumers in the world. We make the majority of the household spending decisions. So if you have a, a player or a supporter or a volunteer who's a female, you've got uh, a supporter for life who is more likely to put her hand in her pocket to go to a test match or um, a super rugby game. So there's... Um, a lot of uh, concern from myself, former Black Ferns, other women in the game. Um, and I just hope like how Rob Nicol is going to fight for Farah Palmer Cup because 2006, they didn't run that competition. What a shambles that was. And we've got a Women's World Cup next year um, and we have to put a good showing. It's the first time uh, we have a Women's World Cup. And the other thing is, you know, uh, MBIE uh, was being, I guess, um, asked for cash for the festival side of the Women's Rugby World Cup. Now that the government's given out so much money because they've had to, you know, where does that leave the investment for the Women's Rugby World Cup next year? Um, with New Zealand rugby uh, being under so much pressure, uh, who's going to pay for the tournament? Is World Rugby going to have to put their hand in the pocket? And if they don't put enough in, it uh, will impact on, I guess, how well this tournament is run, received, marketed. Marketed is the most important thing. Because while women's rugby has, um, in the last couple of years, generated really good television audiences, Black Ferns, um, particularly the French women's team and the English, the Six Nations is good too. Um, if the marketing isn't put into this World Cup next year, um, New Zealand has never paid to go into the gate to see a women's rugby game specifically. How the hell do you think you're going to get average Kiwis into these matches um, in venues, which are um, unusual venues, Northland, uh, Waitakere, uh, and hopefully Eden Park. And Eden Park has to have a hell of a lot of people in to make it um, viable to run it there as well. So, um, yeah, I'm worried. It, it does go some way to illustrate, though, the situation that rugby finds itself in because, as we've already mentioned throughout this series and certainly in episode one, you have the demands of the community game, the amateur game, uh, you have a professional sport uh, which is trying to prop up everything and that makes it a massive challenge. The NRL bar gets to run the NRL. It runs a competition. Uh, again, it runs a professional sports tournament, but rugby is very different. It's a very different proposition, and there's an awful lot of mouths to feed throughout the system. So uh, this this is complex. Just on that, the NRL um, is run by the ARLC, which is the Australian Rugby League Commission, and they cover all grassroots and pathways. So, you know, the NRL generates 90% of the income, and it gets 42 cents in the dollar of the income it generates, and the rest goes to fund pathways, grassroots, women's, indigenous, all things that are good and needed. And um, but same same fights. Yeah, there are lots of hands out for the same pot, and the AFL is exactly the same. So I don't think you know New Zealand rugby is Robinson Crusoe in that regard. I think, um, but and there are opportunities to learn from other sports how to do it and how not to do it. Um, and I think. You know, one of the things you touched upon earlier, Melody, was how about how you know it's important to get girls into the game, young women uh, from an early age. And the one thing that the AFL, well, not the one thing, but one thing the AFL does very well, is they they run a program for kids called Auskick. And I don't know if you've heard about it or seen it, but basically from age five, every kid turn up, it's free, so it's paid for by NAB, National Australia Bank, one of their sponsors, obviously owned BNZ in New Zealand. And any kid can play AFL for free. And they turn up and they kick a footy to each other. It's no contact, but it's fun. You do it for one year, you may, may never go back, but that's there with you. That's your recollection. It's your first recollection of the game. And it stays with you for life. And that's why the AFL has the highest engagement of any sport from a, a female audience. And that will stand in a very good stead in the long run. 
Well, it's, I wanted to move on to a, to a player point of view. Uh, you know, Bart, by the way, that's a fantastic stealth delivery of a coffee during this podcast. Uh, that <laughs> you, you've, got your, you've got your life on lockdown there, mate. Um, uh, we, we are going to be talking about global calendars. Bill Beaumont uh, has been elected chairman of World Rugby alongside Bernard Laporte as his deputy chairman. The global calendar is back on the table uh, it sounds great in some ways, in theory. In other ways, no one quite knows how it is feasible. The players had some arguments last year around the, the sheer workload involved in any League of Nations concept. Uh, are the players and, and their various lobbying groups going to support any moves to globalise the season or are we talking about the calendar more than the programme? I think... I, it comes back, if, if we think about performance of the, why do we want a global calendar? We want a global calendar so we can have better, more meaningful competitions, I think, with that League of Nations. And to me, I equate a global calendar with effectively evening out the playing field a little bit and making sure that everyone has similar amounts of preparation time, everyone can be together. We're not in the club versus um country conflict because that's the biggest issue like just if we if Fiji were invited into the rugby championship as a status quo we saw exactly what happened with Argentina when they got invited the the teams up north didn't want to contract them because of the the global release window which guarantees that those players have to be let go to play for their country um falls right at the start of the French club season so um, you know, the Argentinians had to accept pay cuts or they had to leave. And that's exactly what would happen to the Pacific Islands if we did that again. Now, that might be taken care of because, you know, it is increasingly difficult for foreign players to get into France. And um, they've done things up in, in the UK um, and Ireland around trying to, you know, uh, focus on their own talent as well. So that could change. But that's that's what I see from a global calendar is we... We, we really put Test Rugby up at the pinnacle of the sport um, and we we make it more of an even playing field. But you are going to have a conflict with the professional clubs in a way because if you increase the amount of, of Test match action during any global season, you are going head-to-head with other elements of the professional game, the privately owned clubs in particular. So that does, as one of rugby's biggest uh, pros and cons is it the international game? Is it the fact that Test Match Rugby is the pinnacle so that all the professional teams underneath never quite reach the status of an NBA team or an AFL team? AFL doesn't have a national team to worry about. Rugby League's international program is not huge by comparison to Super League or the NRL. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's necessary to play more rugby, and I think that's going to be the magic that comes back to what Bart talks about, about scarcity. It'll actually be... You know, if it, things have to shift, right? Like you're not going to be able to play. So your, your June window or July window now goes. Rugby Championship, I think part of the drive of wanting to bring in a Fiji or a Japan is actually so they can play less test matches. You know, it's not the two here and the two there and all that sort of stuff. And then you have something at the end of the year, October, November, where, where people, you know, it's compelling. It, it means something. And I think, personally, I, I like one of the biggest things for rugby for me is that we do have meaningful tests every year. Um, you know, something is riding on it. It's not like other sports where football, where they're actually called friendlies, they're not called test matches. And cricket, I think, you know, with the advent of the short-form game and, and the growth... There's just so much of it. It's just noise. And it's no wonder that the players, you talk to them, what do they want to play? They want to play test matches. You know, they love the five-day thing because it's scarce. They don't get to play a lot of it. Um, You know, they love it. So I think it is, uh, and if we can have an aligned club window where everyone around the world's playing club rugby, well, then that might throw up different opportunities as well. And that's, you know, what, what... you know, one of Bart's best things is being visionary about different events and different things and, and what you can do. And I'd be interested in his thoughts around if we can do that, does that throw up something for a, 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 a club-wise that we can really drive, again, some really special moments in the game by having clubs from the north playing clubs from the south? No pressure then. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, you don't get a lovely office like that unless you've got a few good ideas. It's my wife's. Um, <laughs> look, I think, um, yeah, I think in the near term, a global season to me, as someone new into into the seat, feels optimistic. Um, 
I think uh, to Simon's point earlier, perhaps we aim for separation, clear delineation between club and international rugby. Whether that answers your point, can club rugby get to that level? I don't know. Fundamentally, just by dint of, um, you know, 12 professional clubs going into one national team, I think you're always going to have an international team that delivers something, you know, that is just up here. And, um, you know, there's 12 tests a year versus 24 club games. So at the end of the day, I think whilst that remains the case, I think international rugby is always going to be the pinnacle and it's going to have the best players and it's going to deliver the best spectacles. Um, but, you know, I do think there will be an opportunity for, I do like the idea of July moving to October and then October rolling into November. North come south, south go north. If you can integrate that into something that looks and smells like a joined up competition with a winner, that'd be really useful. And then I do think over time, um, if you can carve out windows for clubs and internationals, there should be an opportunity for a cross-border club comp that is a gear or two up on what exists today. Well, comment Bart made there about how test matches, we want the best players there. Now, it comes back to this whole eligibility thing and, and is it going to be possible that players will be able to go back and play for the, uh, you know, for another country, etc. Now, if we all talk about rugby being the pinnacle, why don't we want our best players playing? And why do we have this section of people that we turn our back on? Now, I look at what league does, and again, you know, league's not, I don't think that they've got the recipe right, but they want people to watch their test matches. When they have their international weekends, they want people to watch. So they've made rules to suit, which is we just want, if we've got four test matches on, it would be four test matches on, we want the best, my math's not going to be quick enough here, 52 players out on the field playing. So, of course, you can go and play for Tonga or Samoa or Fiji, Australia, New Zealand, whatever, and they they make sure that they have the best players. And I don't, I mean, it's a, it doesn't feel quite right all the time, but we have to do something about that if we want our best players playing, if we're going to say it's the pinnacle. Simon, I, you won't get an argument from me, I think, that should have been done ages ago. It's ridiculous. Um, but let's be honest, Italy, Scotland, they don't want Pacific Island nations at full strength with every available athlete that's played for every other national country. That's, this is where the issue is. It would be yeah, brilliant. But I, yeah, but I, I don't think it's necessarily just the the two nations you've mentioned and others similar to them that have uh, that have stymied the opportunity for others to go back and play test matches for potentially the country of their origin or birth or a country they've moved to. I mean, this is deeply embedded in the culture of world rugby, which is very uh, old school and will need to change over time, and I'm sure will. But ultimately, you, Ports is right. If you want to say this is the best tournament in the world, this is the best contest we can muster, and yet you've left out six guys who should be eligible and should be out there on the field, again, we come back down to, is this product strong enough? And, you know, I I just think rugby needs to sort of start to celebrate its stars and say, if international rugby is still going to be the pinnacle of our sport, let's find a way to get the best 300 players in the world playing for an international side, whoever that might be. And there is no perfect system I can see right now, and I don't think leagues is it, Ports, um, your comments notwithstanding. But we've got to have a way, don't we? We've got to have a way that Charles Piatel, for instance, is playing international rugby right now. Yep. Agree. (laughs) Well, glad. It's a first between you and me, Mel. But I know we have uh, we can't keep you too long and we, we do need to wrap it up. And as always, we, we haven't had time to cover half the things we would have liked to. But how do you feel about heading into this new role, uh, especially the role alongside World Rugby? I know the circumstances aren't ideal given what we're going through, but do you feel genuinely energised by the opportunities ahead for rugby and for New Zealand within that organisation? Yep. I mean, ignorance is bliss, right? So I'm sitting here with a blank sheet of paper and and I'm optimistic. It's probably uh, my default position in life. And I don't think that will hurt unnecessarily. I think whilst there are challenges, there is rare opportunity in rugby at the moment because for the first time forever, probably, you can drive five years change in five months. Now, you've got to do some thinking. You've got to get it right. So that's the challenge. But the opportunity is there to make people, to pull people to be more collegiate and to get better outcomes. And part of that is necessity. And part of it is um, 
self-preservation. So those are good motivators. And I think, um, I, I really think there is a window for the game. And, you know, Bill has electioned on change. He's elect, you know, he's electioned on a few things. But if he, you know, has his way and gets the, gets those brought to the front of the agenda and delivers it, then that will be better for the game. So, yeah, I, I think watch the space. Um, if you call me in a year's time and I'm lying in the corner crying, <laughs> sucking my thumb, then, you know, uh, the naivety wasn't well placed, but we're going <laughs> to jump in and have a crack. Uh, Bart Campbell, uh, congratulations first uh, on your appointment to the New Zealand board and, and to World Rugby Exco as well. We look forward to seeing your progress and wish you all the best. Port's always a pleasure. Melody, thank you very much for your insights. Can I have the last word? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not going to stop you. Good. Two things. Um, Bart, do not have a drink with Bailey Mackey unless you want a very long night and you like seafood. That's my first piece of advice for you, for your fellow New Zealand board members. Sounds similar. (laughs) And the second thing I just want to finish was, um, I just want to change the conversation around women's rugby. It's not just about investment, it's about the fact that they are commercially viable and they can be sold to sponsorship companies. Um, There are companies that are interested, they just need to know who the players are, who the audience is, and get the data on their supporters and coaches, which New Zealand Rugby has has all of that information. So if they present this differently to companies, I think they can really get some good sponsorship on board for those black ferns. I'm in furious agreement with you. Great. I like you. (laughs) (laughs) Guys, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Thanks to Halo Sport and the spin-off. That's been Rugby Unwrapped. Cheers. (laughs) 